<laughs> it only takes a few minutes to go from the camera to the board. God is good, yes? yes. Amen. And he makes a difference for us. And the things that we face, he makes a difference for us. Yes. And um, the world doesn't understand that. They really don't understand the peace that we have in knowing him. What is the true test of discipleship? Is there a test that will reveal your true level of spiritual growth? And how can you tell if a person is really a sincere follower of Christ? Is it determined by your church attendance record? Because no. I grew up when they kept very clear records of who attended Sunday school and who did not. And at the end of the year, if you didn't miss, you got a pin. Now, I never wore those pins, but I earned a lot of them because our family just went to church every Sunday. It's what we did. And so there was never, well, there was one time. But there was, there was never really a time when, uh, when I thought that I would not be in Sunday school and church if we were in town. I mean, it was just going to happen. I've told you about the one thing that I had when my mother had told me all those years, son, you go to church because you want to, not because you have to. And I bought that for several years. And I just went to church every week because I wanted to. Then one Sunday morning, I woke up and I just really was not feeling great. And I said, Mom, you know what? And she said, she said wake up. It's time to ready for church. I said, you know what? I don't think I'm going to go today. And she said, get up, mister. You're going to church. I said, now, oh, wait a minute. You've been telling me all these years that I go because I want to, not because I have to. She said, that's right. But now that you've decided you don't want to, you go because you have to. That was the kind of reasoning we had in our family. And for some reason, it made sense to me. I got up and went to church. <laughs> but a person could be in attendance every day for years and still not be a mature Christian. Isn't that possible? Oh, yeah. Sometimes people get into leadership positions so that they can show that they are mature in the faith. And I know a lot of churches have pens for people like deacons and ushers and, you know, parking lot attendants and whatever. And they wear these badges proudly. And I guess as many badges as you can get, finance committee, that's a big one, and just whatever. And so you can put those on your suit coat as you come to church and everyone knows that you're important. <laughs> what they don't know is, are you a mature believer? Just because you have positions does not mean that you have maturity in Christ. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah. So perhaps a true believer is the one who is more demonstrative, has stickers on his car, you know, identifying his church, and, and maybe wears a, a big cross on his lapel so people know that he's a Christian, and he's always handing out brochures and flyers to people and inviting them to church and talking about his church, and he's very, very outgoing about it. Maybe that's, that, maybe that's what maturity in the faith is, but not really. A person could do all of those things and still have no spiritual depth. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Our spiritual depth is determined by the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. <coughs> What is he doing in our lives? And how are we responding to the Holy Spirit? Um, it's our character that reveals our maturity. It's who you are at the deepest part of your life. That commitment to Christ. That love for God and for his word. That's where maturity is found, is in the man's character, the woman's character, where the Holy Spirit has been <coughs> growing them for years, and they are showing the fruit of the Spirit in their life. Would you agree with me on that? Yes. So those things are fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It just doesn't necessarily indicate growth. And if we really want to know if we're growing, then we need to take a good look at where we are. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. So you're not breaking the law if you do those things. You're also pleasing God if you do those things. 
because if you are left to the Holy Spirit to work on you and change your conduct and your thoughts and your attitudes, the Holy Spirit's going to change you for the better. And there will be indications of that in time. People will see, you know, you're kind of a different person than you used to be. And so God wants us to grow spiritually as the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Don't you think that's true? It's a natural thing. The Holy Spirit is in you. You're going to start growing. If you're listening to the Spirit of God, He's going to help you grow. And you're going to change in a number of ways because of that. Over the past two weeks, we've taken a close look at the first three uh, tests of the, uh, the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, and peace. Yes? yes. Now, I've got to tell you the truth. I kind of like that slide because it looks pretty authoritative. And I don't really look very authoritative, but... But the test of a true disciple of Christ, and underneath there, there's a whole bunch of things that we can do uh, in church work, like tithing and other kinds of things. But that's really not the true test of a disciple. The true test of a disciple is, is the Holy Spirit changing your life? Are you growing in sensitivity to God? and a love and a passion for Him and a desire to do the things that are pleasing to Him. That's the heart of a growing Christian. So we looked at love, joy, and peace. All of those are important, yes? And today my plan was to cover patience and kindness. But I'm not going to do that. I'm only going to cover patience. Why? Because if you want to know about kindness, you're going to have to be Patient. Patient. Exactly. You see, we're really on track here, aren't we? <laughs> patience. The word is macrothumia. It means patience, endurance, constancy, steadfastness, perseverance, forbearance, long suffering, slowness in avenging wrongs. Ooh, I don't know why they had to put that one in there. <laughs> now we're going to come back to this at the end of the message, okay? I just want you to see it. I want you to see the ways this word macrothemia is used in the scripture. And it's a very important word for us. Now that word's found 14 times in the New Testament. So the first thing I want you to know is that patience is a divine quality. It's a divine quality. In other words, God has patience. And it's a good thing he does. Because of us, you know. God has to be patient to work with us because we sometimes are not listening as carefully as we should. And sometimes as we grow in our religion and our religious practices, we get opinions about things. And so we start doing things, whether they're from the Holy Spirit or not. So God has to be patient with us. He's bringing us along. We're growing. We're becoming. It doesn't happen overnight. But over a period of time, definite changes are taking place. And that's what we're looking for. So patience is a divine quality, and it's best illustrated by the life of Christ. You want to know what kind of attitudes we should have, what kind of behavior we should have? Look at Jesus. He's the perfect example of a godly believer because he demonstrates the fruit of the Spirit every day in his life. And we can do the same thing. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. I want to stop there for a moment. God is patient toward us. And it's a good thing. Because if God had not been patient with us, he may not have reached us. Because, I don't know about you, but I didn't respond to the gospel the first time I heard it. I mean, I didn't get saved the first time I understood what the gospel meant. It took me a little while. Now, I would say a matter of months. But I was getting increasingly uncomfortable in church. I especially didn't like the invitation hymn. You know what I'm saying? Because I was sensing that God was saying, I have something for you and I want you to to live a different life than where you're thinking, I want you to listen to me. So God is patient with us, and he's guiding us along, and he knows that sometimes we mess up. Right, Bill? We do. Yeah. I'm not saying that Bill messes up. I just know he knows I do, so 
I didn't tell him that hurt. Well, <laughs> there we go. He's patient to where I got in trouble the other day. You know that, don't know you? you do. Okay. Hey, we made a man. Okay, we're good. We're good then. He's patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God wants everyone to be saved. He wants everyone to be in heaven someday, yes? Mm -hmm. And he is patiently working with us to draw us to faith. Next verse. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. Go ahead. And once you, who once were disobedient, I'm skipping a few verses because I can't read all the text because we'd be here forever. Who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting, kept waiting in the days of Noah. He kept waiting until the ship was built. Yes? And so God was patient because that took a long time. God... I, when God first gave him the dimensions of that ship, can you imagine that Noah said, seriously, Lord, that big? I can't even imagine something. I've never had a house that big. I mean, it was huge. Have you ever been to the place out in uh, in Arkansas? No. Kentucky. Thank you. We've been there. God is patient with me. So God is patient, waiting through the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons who were brought safely through the water. Now, stop, no, hold that one just for a second. You can leave it right there. God is patiently working to bring salvation to the lives of individuals. He is slowly but steadily bringing salvation to a world that is lost and sinful and in, involved in all kinds of insanity, and I'm sometimes stunned by the things I hear going on out in the political world and stuff. I think, my goodness, I don't know how we survive at all. But I want you to know, God is patiently working, and he's doing that because he intends to bring many of us into his kingdom someday, and that takes a long process for him to cultivate a relationship with each of us. It may have happened to you overnight, but it didn't happen to the Holy Spirit overnight. He was working in your heart for some period of time before you finally said yes. And then even after you said yes, there were times when the Holy Spirit was saying, oh no, let's not go down this road. This is not the right path for you, Keith. And I sometimes would go down that path anyway and find out later on, you know, that probably wasn't the right thing to do. But the Holy Spirit was saying that all along. I just needed to listen to him a little closer, you know? The patience of God kept waiting. God is waiting today. Because he knows what the end of this world is going to be. He knows when it's going to come, doesn't he? Yes. And he's patiently waiting. Now, he is not inactive. He is working to draw people into his kingdom. And God knows exactly what he's doing. And I want you to know that he knows the time frame perfectly. Next verse. Galatians 4. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. I want you to look at that first phrase, when the fullness of the time came, God sent his son. Why did Jesus come into the world when he did? Because that was the fullness of time. That was the perfect time. God knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly what was going on in the world, and this was the perfect time for him to introduce the Messiah to the world and go through all those things that Jesus did in, on this earth. But God knew exactly what he was doing. I just want you to see that that was carried out in the fullness of time. God didn't do it too soon. He didn't do it too late. He did it in the perfect fullness of time. And God always works in the fullness of time, does he not? Amen. He knows what he's doing, and he's working in our lives, and he's doing good things. He wants us to grow and to develop. So the fullness of time means a perfect time. And who, deter who determines when the fullness of time is? It's not us, right? We don't determine it. I mean, if we could determine it, we would have said a long time ago, Lord, this world's getting crazy. We're ready for heaven. 
we're ready to go to heaven. Um, I have some people that I've met out at the cemetery who said much the same thing. Listen, I, I'm ready to go whenever that time comes. And you'll go in the fullness of time. You'll go in God's time, right? right. So we just need to trust him. And this whole thing of, of God's time scale says to me that God is in charge. The world is not in charge. The political parties are not in charge. I don't care where you come out on the spectrum. They're not in charge of this world. God is. And he is taking us toward that moment of salvation when everything will come to fruition and we'll experience the fullness of God with a new body in the new place to live without sin, without death, without suffering. And God has that all set up and he knows exactly when he's going to do it. Don't you agree with that? Yes. The perfect time. God has perfect knowledge. He knows what you're thinking right now. He knows the problems you're dealing with in your life, and your family. He knows every bit of it. Nothing is a surprise to him. And he's already working on your behalf to encourage you, to strengthen you, to help you to deal with those issues because God wants you to deal with it successfully. And he knows that in the fullness of time, there are events that are going to take place that can be life-changing for you and for those around you. And so... Um, I think it's important for us to trust God's timing. So when the Bible says that we're to be patient, folks, it means trust God's time. Trust God's knowledge. Trust his power and know that he's going to take care of everything. Now, the second thing I want to say to you is that patience is often a divine command. There have been times in the Bible where God commanded people to be patient. And it was very clear that he wanted them to be patient. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. You'll know this text. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for, the, for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then they went to the city, and they waited, because Jesus told them to do what? Wait. He told them to do what? Wait. What is waiting? Patience. What do we do when we're waiting? Being patient. Exercising patience. Okay. <laughs> Gathering them together. I'll skip down the next verse. I skipped a few, but it's important. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who's been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. So they went back into the city as Jesus told them to. He said, wait in the city until the Spirit is poured out on you. And until that happens, wait. Gosh, that's a hard command, isn't it? Yeah. Just wait. Just don't do something stupid. Just wait. You don't have to do anything. I mean, what a command from God. Just wait. Now, God has a lot of followers who are pretty inactive anyway, so what he says to them is, as you were. <laughs> Just wait. So they went into the city. The Bible says that they were praying, and that there was a unity inside this group of believers, 120 of them in that room, and they were praying, and they were waiting, and they were fellowshipping with one another, and they were waiting, and they were trusting that the Lord was going to do something really significant. But they hadn't seen it yet, so it must not have happened yet, so they waited, and they waited, and they waited until that moment took place. And so that's what God intended for them to do, is just to wait. But that's hard to do. It's hard to wait. Simon Peter was always a leader, wasn't he? In the yeah. band of disciples. Isn't he the one who always wanted to do something? Oh, yeah. Even if it was something stupid, he still wanted to do it. I love him. I, I love someone who sometimes does something stupid and, and uh, does it for the glory of God. Uh, Simon Peter, he had an idea. And his idea was that we need to do something. I think we need to hold an election as soon as possible. What a great idea. And that's what proves to me that Simon Peter was a Baptist. Because, because when Baptists don't know what else to do, let's elect somebody to do something. Let's choose someone. Are you with me? 
We've been doing that for a long, long time. We're perfect at that. Elections, we do elections really well. And uh, so Simon Peter stands up and tells the group, you know what, we need to have an election. There is a, 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 a person missing from the band of disciples, that was Judas. Someone has to fill that slot, so it's our job to fill that slot. Now that's an interesting concept because I would think, and I'm not very smart, I would think that if God wants to fill that slot, he can do it. He can do it, don't you think? Simon Peter thought, no, this is something we need to do. Well, what did the Lord tell them to do? Wait. Wait. Did he tell them to have a meeting? No. Did he tell them to elect anybody to something? He did not. He said, wait. This is hard to wait because we think something needs to be done. I've told you this story before probably, but I was in my dad's office one day. I was a college student, and he was an executive vice president over this company handling all of their uh, data processing and all those kinds of things. He's a computer guy. I'm never, I've never been in, in, accused of being a computer guy. At any rate, <laughs> so this guy came into the office and he was panic stricken. Oh, check, we've got a problem. We've got this, we've got that, we've got to do something. We've got to do this. We can do this or we can do that. And I mean, he just, for about 10 minutes, he just exploded into all of this disaster. And what are they going to do? And what are we going to do? And check, what should we do? And well, I, I see three things that we had. And he just went on and on until he ran out of breath. And my dad just sat there behind his desk. And then he said this, George, we don't have to do anything. And I was sitting right there in that office, and I thought, you know what? In a lot of situations, you're absolutely right. We get panic-stricken. So we, we want to do something, but we do something that doesn't help, but it helps us to at least think we're doing something. But we don't have to do it. We can wait. We can wait. And when we're waiting, we can do nothing, and it's okay. So what I said to you is that the spiritual life involves doing nothing. Waiting on the Spirit of God. Yes? Yes. It's interesting to me that um, this name, Math Matthias, you know that's who they elected? <coughs> Let's read it. For it's written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate, let no one dwell in it, and let another man take his office. Simon Peter is saying that's referring to the lost disciple. Okay? Therefore, it is necessary, now this is Simon Peter talking, it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So it's got to be someone who's been with us all this time, and one of those persons must fill this position. Now, I'm sure he gave an impassioned plea over this whole thing and how important it was. It's in the scripture. Someone would take his place. It's incumbent upon us. That's a good word. It's incumbent upon us to do something. Oh, yeah. But what did the Lord say? He said, wait. Simon Peter said, vote. <laughs> now, let's see how that election came out. So they put forward two men. Joseph called Barsabbas who was also called Justice, and a man named Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you have chosen. Now, we've put two people forward, and we want to know which one you've chosen, God. Well, maybe God had chosen someone else. You think? Maybe he had chosen someone else. Simon Peter is throwing two people out there on the floor saying, okay, Lord, which one? And maybe the Lord's answer is, I told you to wait. I didn't tell you to vote. I said, just be patient and wait. Because God has this all covered. Verse 25. To occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place, and they drew lots for them. This is a spiritual thing because you can always say, God controlled the way the lots came out, you know? It's kind of like the bingo thing, you put a number, in the well, if, if this name comes out, it must be of God because he has control over the machines if he wants to, right? Or God could say it's silly and just let you do something dumb. They drew lots, 
and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. All right, that's awesome. That's awesome. We hear his name twice in the same context, the same passage. Twice. We don't ever hear from him again. I'm not putting Matthias down. I'm just saying Simon Peter was not called of God to fill that slot. Because I think that God may have had someone else in mind for that position. What do you think? I know. Because later on, this young man will come along who at first hates Christ, hates the Christian faith, and does everything he can to destroy them until the Holy Spirit dramatically transforms his life, and all of a sudden he becomes Paul the Apostle. apostle. Maybe God had him in mind for that spot. Yes. Sorry, Simon Peter, but... We don't need your reasoning, and we don't need your help. God had this under control. We read about Paul 138 times in the book of Acts alone. Now, I tell you, between those two men, they were probably both good men, and I suspect Matthias was a good man and loved the Lord, and that's fine. But of those two people, which one impacted the kingdom of God more? I have to say, Paul, because I have no idea what Matthias did, and maybe he did some good things, but you know what? God knew what he was doing. Even though Simon Peter thought he had to take some action, God knew that that was not true. So sometimes when we get in a hurry, we get rushed, we get pushed to do something, and so we do it, and we do the wrong thing. So we need to be patient. Now maybe we're mistaken about all this, and the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the church, and we didn't know it. Maybe it was a secret thing, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And no one would ever know. It's just a couple of people walk in and go, hey, by the way, I was filled with the Holy Spirit last night. What does that mean? I don't know. Well, you're going to know because when God pours out His Spirit, you're going to see and you're going to know. And you're going to experience it. They're going to know, right? Amen. So He said, wait until the Holy Spirit is poured out on you. Patience is often a divine command where God says to us, wait. And I can show you a lot of scriptures where God told someone to wait and they didn't do it. And it proved to be disastrous. One of them was when King Saul was young and they were going to go to battle. And Samuel told him, no, that you don't go to battle until I'm there. You wait for me. Now, yes. he was speaking as a prophet of God. So if he was mistaken in what he said, God would deal with him. But he said to him, don't do anything until I get there. Well, the enemy was getting ready to come to battle, and so he got nervous, and the prophet wasn't there yet, so he took matters into his own hands, and it was a disaster. But what was he told to do? Wait! Just, just wait! And God will do something very special. He wants us to wait. Patience, waiting on the Lord, is a worthy example for us to follow. When you see people in the Bible who did wait, that's a good example for us. And in fact, there's a lot of people in the scripture who give us a very, not just a good example, but they encourage us to follow that example. Some of the greatest spiritual leaders in the scriptures were men of spiritual patience. That's one reason why they were so spiritually powerful because they knew how to wait on the Lord and then when they took action it was the action God intended for them to take that's critical because if we don't wait for the Holy Spirit if we don't wait for God we may take action and wish later on that we hadn't listen to the words of David three times in this one psalm may those who fear you see me and be glad because I wait for your word my soul languishes for your salvation. I wait for your what? You are my hiding place and my shield. I wait for your word. Now, David was not perfect, correct? He, he did some pretty stupid things. But the reality is that David was a, he was a powerful man of God. Did some stupid things, yes. Also lived a powerfully devoted life. And here, he just is saying, I'm waiting on God's word. I'm waiting on God's word. I'm waiting on God's word. That's a good place to be where we are patiently waiting for God to instruct us. Listen to Moses. Listen to what he said. 
Moses therefore said to them, wait, and I will listen to what the Lord will command concerning you. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. That's a good thing. Moses is giving us the same example. I'm going to wait until the Lord tells me what to do, and then we'll take action. That's a good thing, yes? Not just Moses. Listen to Isaiah. This is one of the greatest passages that we can read on this. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? And the justice do me escapes the notice of my God. Do you not know? Listen carefully. Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. I, I love that verse. Don't you understand that God knows everything? He's never mistaken about anything. That's right. And so when God looks at the situation where he knows exactly what we're going through, he gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who what? Wait, Wait for the Lord will gain new strength will mount up with wings like eagles, <coughs> will cough uncontrollably until he gets a drink of water. <laughs> mount up with wings like eagles. Eagles have pretty powerful wings. At the cemetery I work at, we've got about two dozen geese that live on our lake. And they're flying in and out all the time, honking. And usually I think the leader honks first and everyone else starts honking, they follow him. And they fly, they fly in pattern uh, forms all around the cemetery. And they'll land somewhere and they'll eat some stuff off the grass and they'll go back over to the lake, back and forth, back and forth. They're not eagles, but they've got pretty strong wings. Mounting up with wings like eagles, he is giving us the image of the most powerful flight they knew about. God's going to give you that kind of strength. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. You see, with God's help, with God's strength, we can do everything God wants us to do. We will have the strength and the ability to do it because God will see to it. If we're being obedient to God, he will see to it that we can carry out the things that he wants us to do. I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about, Lord, I'm getting really tired. God knows you're getting tired. He's got you. The next passage, Jeremiah. The Lord is good to those who what? Wait. wait for him. To the person who seeks him, it is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. Now, we've had some pretty powerful names up on that screen. Now, when you talk about Jeremiah, you talk about Isaiah, you talk about, um, uh, who else do we talk about? Uh, you know, I mean, come on, guys. This is, this is what old age does to you. Moses, Moses thank you, and, and uh, David. Now, those are some pretty powerful voices. Yeah. And they're saying to you, you will make it through. You will have the strength to do what God wants you in whatever setting he places you because he will see to it that you have the strength. He will give you what you need so you will not grow weary or tired or not be able to function. God will help you to do it. So if you're worried that you might not be able to do the things God wants you to do, let me tell you something. God will always provide the strength for you to do the things he wants you to do. Yes? Okay. Which takes me to my final point of this sermon. Are okay. you okay? I feel the same way, by the way. I'm coughing without water. That's bad. Nasty. Patience connects us more closely with God. And it also connects us more closely with one another. Because patient people are easier to get along with, aren't they? Mm -hmm. People who are patient, who are more tolerant, who do not react to things immediately. People who are like that are easier for us to get along with. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I think patience is a great gift. <coughs> Why do you have me coughing? <coughs> you did it. <laughs> Sorry. The Lord says, I have strength enough to finish this sermon. 
Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We are to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That's our calling, every one of us. We're to be peacemakers. We are to be people who build unity in the church. If every one of us was known for our patience with one another, it would be an amazing place to be, wouldn't it? Yes. It would be an amazing place to be. Because most organizations you work in, you're not going to find people who are very patient. I met a man at work this other, the other day, working at a new location now, back, back and forth. He yelled at me. First, he lectured me for 15 minutes <coughs> because I told the caller that the, that the person they wanted to talk to was not at her desk right then, but she would be back in a moment. Can I take your name and number and give it to her so she can call you back? And he lectured me for 15 minutes that I shouldn't have said that. Why? Don't ask. Too long a sermon. <laughs> My point is, it's easier to get along with people who are not bullies or who do not treat you in a disparaging way. It's easier to deal with Christians if we are acting like Christians and we have patience with one another, the body of Christ should be a different atmosphere than the world. It should be a place that's safe, where we can love each other and care for each other, help one another. Don't you agree? Yes. That's what God intends for his church to be. My vision for this church is it will be a safe place for seniors to come, to worship God, to fellowship with one another, and to finish this race in a way that brings glory to God. That's what I think God wants to do here. Colossians chapter 3, last passage. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and what? Patience. Patience. Bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so you should forgive them as well. Patience is the ability to see beyond the problems around you and to accept your brothers and sisters in Christ and respect them for who they are. Even though you may disagree with them, you can be patient and loving and have a relationship with them anyway. Are you with me? Yes. Yes. We are a team. The church is a team. We have, a, uh, we, we have to make a positive impact on one another. We have to. Otherwise, the church is not a help. It's just a hindrance. And trust me, there are churches out there that are a hindrance to a lot of people because people have been hurt so badly in that church. We don't want that to happen, right? We don't want the church to be like that. We want the church to be a place where there is love and peace and acceptance of one another. So, I want to go back for a moment and pull out that word that we looked at earlier, macrothemia, and I want to look at it in just a few different ways so that you can see how it would impact our relationship with one another. If I already talked about God, I'm talking about with one another. This word patience, macrothemia, means endurance. The ability to press on, even in the midst of discouraging circumstances. And there are people going through discouraging circumstances. But to be able to press on, to keep going, to keep trusting God, to know that, that God has the end result in mind. He knows what he's doing. You keep on. That's the endurance we're talking about. We refuse to give up. God's people should not be people who give up. Yeah. We should be the most stubborn people in the world because we're serving a great God and this work is important. Constancy is another word that can be used to define this word macrothemia. There is a consistency about the spiritual life, and this includes a devotion to our teammates. That's a part of it. We're not individuals in the sense that we're all by ourselves in this thing. We're in this together. And if all of my brothers and sisters are falling by the wayside because of one reason or another, and I'm not helping them, this is not a healthy environment for them or for me. Steadfastness, to be resolute, to be firm, unwavering in our faith and character. I said a week ago, I think, that I want my children and my grandchildren to see us in the church, functioning, serving God, believing in Him, studying His Word. I want them to see and know that about us. I look at my mom and dad, and I know they were spiritual giants. 
And I would like for my family to know that we were sincere in our faith. Are you with me? Yes. Resolute, unwavering in faith and character. Brothers and sisters should never have to wonder if you're committed to their care. There should always be someone here who's going to care. Mm -hmm. Perseverance, determination, dedication, unyielding effort. Forbearance, restraint, tolerance, loving and supporting one another even when we're struggling. It's not enough for me to get to the finish line. If my brother or sister has fallen on the side of the track there, I need to help them up and help them get to the finish line as well. Yes? Yes. Long-suffering, tolerant, forgiving, <coughs> understanding. Macrothemia is a definite work of the Spirit. And a place like that where people treat each other like that, that is a very special place. It's sacred. And we cannot have anyone destroy that because it's too important for our spiritual lives that we have that connection with one another and with God. Are you with me? Yes. To help one another succeed. Now, what would a church like that be worth to this community, to other seniors who are alone, who have no friends and spend their life wasting away in an apartment somewhere or whatever, wouldn't they like to find a family like this to help them and to support them? Macrothemia, you can live it to the glory of God and to the benefit of our teammates. I know it all works out in the long run. I know that God knows what he's doing. I do not have a lack of faith. I trust him and him alone to know me to know the things I'm going through and to know how to guide me through those things. And he will allow me to do that and I will do it with strength because the strength comes from him and you'll do the same thing. Amen. And one day we'll be in the kingdom of God and we'll look back and I don't know if we'll be able to look back, but if we did, we'd be able to say, you know what? That was a great time back there when we had each other and we really had that bond, that love for one another and that patience with one another. That was a great time. It'll be better in heaven. But wouldn't it be great if this was just a little slice of heaven? Yeah. I want you to stand. We're going to sing a song. It's an old hymn. It was sung first by a turtle. Huh? And, yes. <laughs> and I've asked Debbie to come help me sing it because, you know, my singing voice. It's loud but not pleasant. <laughs> but um, this, this particular hymn is very important because it talks about patience. And uh, you may know it because, it, Debbie, I need you down here. <laughs> because, the reason I'm saying this is because when I was preparing this message, this song kept coming to me. Oh, we need to do this song. Everyone probably knows this silly song, but if not, you'll learn it real easily. But, uh, and then when I was talking to Debbie this morning, she mentioned, oh, it's too bad we're not going to sing this. And she mentioned this song. It's supposed to be. And I was always, I was going to do it in the first place. It's so fun when I'm ahead of my wife. Uh, That's rare, but you know what? That's awesome. So we're going to.